And now, coming to you from the Pensado Media Center, powered by Westlake Pro. He's the go-to guy for Sturgill Simpson and Chris Stapleton. We've got a busy October. Registration opens up for the Pensado Awards, judging on the Indaba contest, and a brand new ITL. You're at the place, it's Pensado's place. It's always a great day when you guys drop by. Thanks for hanging out with us. Um, I got nothing. You got nothing? <laughs> <laughs> Should I go from yes. there? Okay. <laughs> Thank you for passing it over to me. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Great to gather back with our family. Big thanks to our sponsors. They are 1500 or Nothing, doing big things in the education space. The Blackbird Academy, doing big things in the education space. Westlake Pro, doing big things in the audio space. Avid, DTS, Lander, and Fab Factory, also all doing big things. Um, that schedule of October continues to be one ripe with opportunity for you. We'll be at Imstafesta Toronto on October 14th. It's located at the Ryerson RTA School of Media. About 11 o'clock a.m., Dave and I will be there keynoting with Boy Wonder and a bunch of other Toronto notables. Lots of cool giveaways, and we want to take the chance to meet you. Uh, sign up right here at this link. It's free. It's going to be good to be home in Canada and see all my Canadian brethren, so come see us. And then later, if you're around New York City, We'll be there uh, at AES on Friday the 20th. We're interviewing the Menza level, brilliant musician, absolute amazing guy, and this year's Pensado Giant Award winner, the one and only Greg Wells. And we're also going to give more cool stuff away. So that event starts around 10, 15 or so. All the information, again, right here in the link below me as well. All these things are free, so you want to make sure you're there. Dave and I are going to stop by a bunch of different booths, including the Blackbird booth, which is booth number 230. They're our family. We encourage you to just come by and see yeah. them and see Karma. Uh, again, both Instafesta and AES are free, provided you use these links. In certain cases, like AES, they gave us free links for our audience. They usually charge for everybody else. Take advantage of that. Plus, all this cool gear we're giving away. Chongor, what kind of stuff do we have? We've got Isotope, Avid, Beat Skills, Fab Filters, Celimony, Landers. There's so many things I wish I could win them. It's, it's going to be good. But you can wait. steal them. No, you can't. <laughs> no. You can't, you can't do there's, that. There's better homes for these gifts. I don't know what it is that we just like giving stuff away. <laughs> I know. It's like a, just like throwing the stuff away. It's, it's pretty cool. And I, you know I, what? I remember when it would have been so important for me to have something. And yeah. I will tell you that, listen, we, we're candid. We know that in the audience that watches our show, you know, they have to sort of get through the part where we talk about our incredible yeah. sponsors. Yeah. But this is why we have incredible sponsors. One, they make sure the show comes to you for free. Yeah. Two, they give you free gear, yeah. support their websites, so support. These people yeah. care about you. So we're not asking a whole lot to, uh, to make sure you support them. Um, I know that you are now deep into your judging process. How's it coming? Pretty good. Pretty yeah, good. Yeah. yeah. Good stuff. You like some submissions? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. They did a good job. Yeah. They did a good job. Oh, like if you drew if you do a curve, it would be generally going up from the first one to now. Oh, know, cool. We've had some some little dips in here, but in general, good stuff. Um, yeah. That I, means and I, I think we should take full credit for that. Oh, let's take full credit. That means you guys are trending. Yeah. They're trending. Yeah. <laughs> They're cool. Yeah. Uh, We'll be announcing those winners within Daba on October 24th. And time for the Pensado Awards. We're going to open up registration this week. You can sign up. Make sure you get there. New vibe, new place, new thing. Got our guest, our guest host in place. We've got Cosine and Samantha Maloney and CLA. He's, yeah. he's the symbol on the basketball. He's a Jerry West on the basketball for us. <laughs> Greg Wells, the giant award winner. Lots of cool presenters, lots of cool things. We're excited yeah. about it. It is, it is on its way. It's the best hang in town. I'm telling you. It's a you, good hang. We, we all complain that do what I do for a living, that we don't see each other like we used to. This is your chance to see each other. Yeah, and, and come and hang out. We get that a lot. Yeah, absolutely. About the award show. Going to be cool. Going to be cool. It's a lot of work, but it's going to be cool. Um, and Master Blaster, you have an ITL for us? I do. Uh, when I first moved to LA, we met very early in, in, in yep. the 90s. And um, the day I felt like I was a pretty good mix engineer was the day Jack Joseph Puig said my name. Uh -huh. He knew who I was. Absolutely. And uh, JJP has some plugins with Waves and the JJP vocal plugin. I'm going to show you some cool stuff with it. Cool. Let's roll it. 
sometimes I have so many choices that I, I, I confuse myself. And then other times I have so many choices, I, I tend to forget some of the things I've had for a while and, and, and get seduced by some of the new things. And uh, I used to use Jack Joseph Puig's uh, vocal plug-in a lot. And then, and then I, I forgot about it for a little while and I, I used it again recently and I was like, damn, this thing's really good. Let me share it with you guys. Uh, so that's my guys coming in. Just ignore that. We're working. We work every day. So, uh, Nico, what's up? <laughs> uh, um, this was a vocal I got from uh, my friend Chris LaBella. The song is Poison. You should hear it pretty soon. R really good remix. Really good remix. So let me show you um, without Jack's plug-in. So we got... She's so deadly, you're so deadly, yeah. She's so deadly, you're so deadly, yeah. This is a plugin I, I, I sometimes forget about too, and it's amazing. This is uh, uh, Colin McDowell's over at McDSP um, DSer. Very musical, very, very musical. A lot of adjustments. Um, She's so deadly, you're so deadly, yeah. She's so deadly, you're so deadly, yeah. Now, you're saying, well, Dave, you didn't take all the S's out. Yeah, no, I've been doing this a while. So, to me, and I'd be glad to hear what you guys think. I learn a lot from you guys. The S's have so much energy and power and emotion in them. When you take too much of the S out, you lose that. So, so I'd rather have a song on the radio that had a little too much than one that had a little too little. And by the time it gets to Spotify or other places, um, it's always less S than you thought it was. So maximize that energy and use it for you and use it for your, your goals. Now here's, here's the start of the hour. This is Jack's plug-in. Uh, magic, uh, all these add really cool stuff. Uh, just experiment with it. Uh, it's, it's a lot of, a lot of EQ going on, some compression, um, and then some, some, some JJP stuff. Uh, I could read the manual, but I just want to be surprised. It's Jack Joseph Puig, man. He's the coolest. And so I'm sure there's fairy dust all over this. I'm sure there's like some unicorn dust and horns thrown in. It's got all kinds of great stuff in it. So check this out. She's so deadly, you're so deadly, yeah. 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 Pretty cool stuff. Try all of Jack's stuff, I'm telling you. Uh, he's just someone I've admired and respected long before I knew him and has made some great, great records. So when he makes something and puts his heart into it, you better, you better think about it. We all use the compressors he's done. We all use the pull tech he's done. But uh, anyway, check it out. Uh, this guy is just a prolific guy. Uh, mm -hmm. Doesn't matter what town he's in, LA, Nashville, whatever mm -hmm. the case may be. Uh, as I said, Chris Stapleton, Sturgill Simpson, they all go to him. Yeah. And we went to him. We actually went to his studio, a uh -huh. historic studio, and had a chance to interview the prolific and talented Dave Cobb. Walking in this room, I just, I felt all the people that have been here in the past, Chet Atkins. Um, how do you incorporate all of this in your productions? Because it feels like I hear it in your music now. I think I think the room actually helps me cheat a lot. Every time I walk in here, I'm humbled by it, you know. And I think when we walk in here, uh, it, it makes us act better too, you know. And we, everybody puts on the kind of the best attitude, and they're happy to be here. And I think it kind of affects how how the records come out, you know. Everybody just kind of taking it in, you know. This was built at a time when it was made when you'd have entire live bands in one room, mm -hmm. string sections, a choir, and a singer all in the same room with no headphones. And so we try to get away with that as much as possible. So it definitely 
very few rooms you can get away with that and, and uh, helps us cheat and helps us have a good time. How, how the hell did you get here? Back when we were in Atlanta, I mean, I, I, I don't have I don't, I have don't clue know, how I got man. To LA and you made it here. I don't know, but man. man. Working we, with Dallas Austin to to being one of the archetypes of uh, of the new old Nashville sound. That's quite a stretch, buddy. You you I would have never in a million years thought I'd live in Nashville. <laughs> I, you know, I'm from Savannah, Georgia, but I, yeah. I started my career in Atlanta and moved to LA the moment I could mm -hmm. and got out there and never thought I was coming back. You know, yeah. and it just kind of fell into coming here over and over again, and this became, I, I think it's, I think Nashville is the Alamo of music now, you know? Mm -hmm. It feels like it's alive and well. It feels like, you know, this was London in the 60s or, or LA in the 70s here musically right now. That's what, that's what drew me here. How did you come, and, I, and I'm being respectful because I have so much admiration and respect for what you're doing, and uh, people don't understand the difficulty of what you're trying to do. How did you come from that background to to really immersing yourself in this, uh, what some people might call Americana movement, or, or I, I just call it trying to make records the best way you can with the music you want to make and the tools that are available. How did you come to 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 that point in time? Because your records are very just honest, organic, and well, one, I'm really bad with computers. I hate the different things. <laughs> I cuss them all the time. I don't even know my password to get on, you know, to start uh, to use well, the thing half the reason. time. But you know, I. I'd always been fascinated with you know reading, reading stories about how the Rolling Stones recorded or Led Zeppelin recorded the Beatles mm -hmm. and you know or Roy Orbison and Elvis. I, I just love the way those records sound. So mm -hmm. I go to the library, you know, pre-internet and just look at pictures of those sessions and try to figure out why. You know, you, you look and there's one mic on the drums, there's one mic on the bass, and everything's so simple. And uh, when I first started, everybody told me you can't do it that way. Like nobody does it that way. You got to multi-mic everything. You got to you know, go to the nine and grid and all that. Mm -hmm. And I just wasn't good with computers. So I started mm -hmm. making these records because that's the only thing I knew how to do. It's much easier, like I'm a really bad engineer, I think. And no, it's a lot no. easier to get phase when you got an overhead and a kick mic. <laughs> if you press a button, it's either in phase mm -hmm. or out of phase, that's it. Yeah. That's, that's where it, so uh, I think I started making these records because they were easier to make, almost in a way, sonically speaking. And it was a lot easier mm -hmm. for people to get a great performance when they're all in the same room together. And they're not having to communicate through little rooms or TV monitors. When they're right there next to each other, it's the same thing as if, you know, we were 15 and rehearsing in a garage. Mm -hmm. It's that immediate, you know, interaction that happens. So I think I started making these records because it was easier, you know. Easier for you. Well, yeah, easier for me. I didn't tell easy. anybody else that. It's yeah. not easy. On, uh, on something more than free, uh, Jason Isbell, how did you get the vocal sound? Because it sounds traditional, but yet I knew it was new. That, that well, juxtaposition I, of old and new. I, I love that that song, by the way. Oh man, Jason's one of my favorite writers. Yeah. Period. He, he, you know, you figure out the lyrics two years later. I know. All the time, he has that. You, you immediately feel the impact of his lyrics, but you know, you actually figure out what it really means a long time afterwards. I think he he rhymed uh, rail and nail in that song. But he's. He's a wizard for I sure. Love that song. He's uh, so how did you get the? Uh, this is my third record I've done with him, and when we did the first record, I was real hot on Coles, forty thirty eights. Not for vocals. Oh yeah, always. He's, really? Yeah, the only mic we use on him is a Coles. That's it. So we but have it him set up. Sounds brighter on the record. Well, that's what a pull text for. <laughs> Again, <laughs> easy to use. It's got one big knob that goes treble, and so uh, you know that's that's just uh -huh. it. we've always done him with two Coles, one on the acoustic and one on the vocal, and. You know, you can put them flat, and they're figure of eight. So the top one's really just getting the vocal, and the bottom one's just getting his acoustic guitar and his really good isolation. And, and so you're recording both at the same time. Always, always. He's in the room with everybody else. You know, bleeding like crazy. So that brings up a, a question: um, How do you deal with bleed? Because uh, you're using a lot of omnis, you're using a lot of um, MS well, techniques. Well, I again. Uh, there's a buddy of mine, Mark Neal, who lives in Valdosta, Georgia. He's a, he's an expert with this stuff. He learned all these tricks from Bill Porter and people like that. And I steal from him, so I'm probably a third generation thief on a lot of this stuff. Okay. But you know, it's really using mics for their polar patterns. You know, right. a lot of times I use a Bayer M160 on the vocal, like the uh, Sturgill Matter Modern record. I used that on the vocal because it was just the tightest hypercardioid mic that I had. Mm -hmm. uh, and the ribbons I'll use a lot. And the figure of eight stuff I'll use a lot. You know, if I have a drummer here and a guitar player here, if I have 
the you know guitar in figure of eight, it does a pretty good job of quieting down the drums. Mm -hmm. So a lot of figure of eight, and you keep you know kind of going angles. So I, I use the mics to their full kind of capacity. I, I didn't know what any of that stuff meant for a long time until I bought that mm -hmm. recording the Beatles book, and I started yeah. again. The, the Ken Scott book. Yeah. Oh, no, no, the, the recording the Beatles one, the big one. Oh, the okay. JJ Blair. And I, I can't read right. that much. That's too much. Well, I, that's it's got a lot of pictures. Me neither, man. <laughs> so you look at the picture and you read, and I started trying all those techniques from from uh, from that book, you know. And mm -hmm. so that's how I kind of figured out they were using lots of figure of eight stuff with the you know modified E47s they had that were modified. Tell me your um, tell me your signal chain on uh, Sometimes I Cry, Chris Stapleton, because it kind of breaks up a little bit, but in such a musical well, that's way. That's his voice, blowing everything out. You know, he's got such, he's such a powerhouse. That's, that's Vance Powell, to be fair, engineered and mixed that record. Uh -huh. I was in this room. Oh, okay. On the Chris record, I'm, uh -huh. uh, any of his records, I'm usually in here playing with him or just in the room in general. Uh -huh. uh, so that's, that would be a Vance thing, but uh -huh. I'm pretty sure uh, it's just simple, man. It's really him. It's him, you know, you set a level... And then, you know, he has everything at 10 the whole time, and then he goes to 12, and then shit blows up, and that's just the sound of those records, you know. I remember this from back in the day. Did you really actually call girls to try and get them to go out with you when you were a kid and play drums and sing over the phone at the same time? <laughs> Man, you, you know, I wasn't a looker, you know. <laughs> you got to do <laughs> yeah, something. But, the the uh, phone's a much safer uh, thing uh, to call, hey, you know. sweetheart, yeah. uh, can you go out on a... Yeah. Can you go out on a date with... <laughs> yeah, it worked, you that, know. No, it didn't. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure it worked. You actually got dates that way. I got a wife. <laughs> I called her By up. Playing I, drape, no, I wish. Drum, drums never got me anywhere. Don't that's, lie. Why I that's why I switched to bass, and I realized that wasn't going anywhere, so I switched <laughs> to guitar. You know. Speaking of guitars, uh, IR1 and uh, Player 2. Um, I'm sorry, man. It's an affliction. It, I know, yeah. especially Gretsch's. I, I know I you have them. an affinity for Gretsch's. Um, you got a country gentleman here? I, I do have a country gentleman here. That's my favorite guitar yeah. ever. The, you know, there's an old great picture in the front that has Chet's country gentleman. Oh, he had a custom wow. color black one, and it was just sitting on the console. I've never seen a black so one. So anytime they were doing, like, promo photos, there was always a country gentleman there. It was a, you know, Chet signature. So you playing a lot of guitar these days? I play on almost every record. It's really an excuse, you know. Yeah. I think I make up parts to be on people's records because I'm probably not supposed to be there half the time. <laughs> <laughs> it also gives me an excuse to go by the guitar shop and look for guitars, too. Um, going back to, to the sound that you like, if, if in, in the course of, of reading about, about you recently, um, this obsession with trying to put labels on your sound, I, I think it's a little bit absurd, um, or, or sometimes the writer will miss the point, which is just a great song with a great performance with yeah, really good production sound. and really good engineering. And, and, and that's what you really try to do. And the tools you try to use it or the to use to do that are the tools that, that you feel are going to give you that best uh, representation of that performance in that song. When you first start a project and you're, and you're, trying, to, and you're trying to outline the path from, from the, the singer walking in the studio to the time that record... Um, leaves your hand what's what's your thought process do you, do you automatically think of how to improve the song first or how to yeah, capture all, the I, essence I, of who that artist is or the the longer i've been doing this the more and more i'm in the live room mm -hmm. I, I don't spend very much time in the control room i, I work with a lot of really great engineers that mm -hmm. you know i know they're great and, and i know we're on the same kind of mindset mm -hmm. they're in the other room and i'm here working on the song because i think mm -hmm. Trying to worry about, I think it's very hard to engineer and produce a record. You know, it's hard to worry about. Oh, there's a buzz on that microphone yeah. cable. Is it the cable? Is it yeah. the mic? So you, you, my brain gets distracted. So I cut all that off when we track. And I'm always just worried about getting the feel. You know, mm -hmm. somebody told me <clears throat> recently about working with uh, Sam Phillips, and uh, you know, I, the older I get, the more and more I'm into lyrics. Mm -hmm. But they were talking about working with, with Sam Phillips, and they said that. He wouldn't even listen to the lyrics until the groove was right. And so, you know, wow. I think I copy that. Once I found that out, I think, you know, validated my craziness. But I'll, uh -huh. I'll, I'll get the feel right before we ever start diving yeah, it deep into everything. it. feels everything. feels everything, I man. guess that's our background, really. Yeah. 
proximity to Muscle Shoals and well, Georgia specifically has such a rich music history with yeah. you know Little Richard and James Brown and yeah. Ray Charles and all this yeah. incredible and then all the Bill Lowry stuff. From oh Southern yeah, he, all this stuff is here. You know, the mm -hmm. first country record ever was cut in Atlanta at the Fox Theater. You know, what was it? Uh, fiddling Jimmy, somebody I can't remember the guy's <laughs> name. Larry Joe, Don, <laughs> something I don't know. But anyway, it was it was good. Somebody, I'm going to get made yeah. fun of for that comment. But it was the first thing was was cut in Atlanta, so that was kind of. Atlanta and Dallas were the first two kind of epicenters mm -hmm. for country, and then it migrated here to Nashville. You know? When you're when you're in the room working with an artist, do you think it's important to capture the the, the true sound in the room, or do you do you, well, you fudge that sometimes? I love gear. I love gear, but I can tell you that the sound the sound comes from the instrument and the source and the mm -hmm. singer and. So, uh, yeah, we're trying to get it in the room first. I mean, before a microphone touches it, it's, you know, uh -huh. we've talked about how we're going to do it, whether it's an acoustic or electric or who's playing what, and, and kind of get the sound right, because that just makes it easier. You, you know, in a nice room, you can pull up faders, and it sounds like a record. Yeah. And I think we try to get it to sound like a record before you ever have to pull up the faders. Okay. And then the control room part and the gear aspect, I think, kicks in a little bit later, and then uh -huh. we start getting surgical, but... Really, it's about getting the sound here, getting everybody to, to feel comfortable. You know, if, if for instance, if we have drums in the same room as the singer, mm -hmm. that drummer's playing real quiet. If he can't hear the singer over his drums, he's playing too loud, and that affects the drum sound dramatically. Yeah. You know, if the drummer's bashing away, there's no room for a vocal. So, we, we, you know, we continually, with the instruments, try to make room for the I singer. I, I, I wish I could remember, but I was listening to a Sturgill Simpson song that you did. And, and I was having trouble picking out the drums, and I thought, that's interesting. Why would Dave do that? Because there's very little on your records that aren't intentional. And so I knew it had to be a reason, and I was missing it. And, 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 and then I just started not trying to listen for any one thing, but just feel the song and the drums just became this wraparound groove that it was kind of weird the way it just kind of, I don't know if I'm articulating well, no, this correctly. I, I, think, but I, think I focused on the song and heard every element, when I was trying to focus on element, I didn't hear it. That, I that's think I've the made, I've made a lot of engineers mad, like really great engineers, because uh -huh. the first thing I go when, when I've worked on something somebody else is mixing, mm -hmm. uh, I mix probably about half of the records I do, but I'll use other mixers who, who are much better than me, and I'll go in and, you know, X mixer will have, be working on kick and snare sound. Mm -hmm. The first thing I do when I see that is just take it all down. I was like, start with a vocal, because mm -hmm. people listen to that. I mean, drummers listen for a snare drum and a kick drum. But your average listener, I think, is listening to the song. If they can't hear the song over the production, mm -hmm. I think you've lost them. So anyway, I, I don't ever, I'm a, I started off as a drummer. That's my first instrument. Mm -hmm. I started playing, you know, when I was four, and, mm -hmm. and I really care about drum sounds. But I think modern record making has made the drums the focal point in a lot of ways. Yeah, individual you know? close miking is, uh, has advantages, but it, 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 it took a little bit away, didn't it? Well, somebody was telling me, I, I met a gentleman here recently who was an original drummer in the 60s here in Nashville, and he was mm -hmm. describing, you know, they had one overhead on the drum, and then and eventually they put a, a kick drum mic, and that was it. And it wasn't about the drums. You know, you'd get the drum sound through yeah, the vocal that was mic. Back in the day when things were only mono. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe I don't know, being smart. Well, no, it, it probably was. You're probably right. But I think, you know, the drum well, sound Bonham, was made up you know? made up from everybody's bleed, you know? Was it was it Glenn Jones that had the three mic technique? Yeah. He's, one of my, he's probably my all time hero. Tell me if you think I'm wrong, because I'd like to learn this from you. A lot of times when I'm mixing, I try to get the overheads to sound really good and then I, and the room mics and then I implement the things I'm missing with the close mics. Well, Absolutely. Like when, we, when we get a big string session, you know how we get it, and, and you, it's basically uh, an XY pair or, or right. a, a pair of stereo mics, right. and then you've got the individual elements that you can enhance and make the listener feel like the you know if a violin is playing a solo part, you can move up the violin mics and that yeah. kind of thing. And that, I try to do that with drums. Is that, is that something that you would... I started doing something about maybe a year ago where we may go straight to digital recording drums. It may be four or five mics on the drums. Uh -huh. And then I'll, immediately after I get done, I'll just reduce it to a stereo pair. 
I'll take, oh. I'll just go ahead and get the drum sound there. And it's usually starting from an overhead and a kick. So technically what you're telling me is that you use loops in your music now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> hey, I'm well, yeah, yeah, from yeah. Dallas. That's right, yeah. <laughs> but no, I mean, immediately, something about committing it to a pair yeah. of tracks, yeah. and I don't have to think about that. I don't have to worry yeah. about the kick drum sound anymore. If it's yeah. wrong, I can, yeah. there's a lot of great digital EQs. You can, yeah. you can beef up the kick, but that's it, done. There's the drum sound. I don't have to come back to it. To me, I, again, it's, it's a, I don't have mental capacity yeah. uh, to look at a session with a lot of tracks. It stresses me out. So yeah. if I just put Same the drums here. on a stereo mm -hmm. set in the mix, mm -hmm. There's a drum. You need them yeah. louder. Turn them up. Turn them down. But messing with them again, yeah. I don't. I don't think it helps. You know the the, the headline for this interview or chat, as I prefer, yeah. is to commit. Commitment yeah. is the greatest creative tool a person has. Absolutely, and that's the one thing that we're the most scared of is committing. Because in a world where you can undo things, in a world where you don't have to worry about punching, in a world where you can never have to worry about not having something to correct a mistake, we don't. We don't make the mistakes better, but those the records we fell in love with are simple, gifted simple, people simple. making the mistakes sound unique. Absolutely. And that's where the up. uniqueness came from. And and we spend so much time destroying that, but uh your 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 willingness to commit I think is refreshing and I think people should think I'm gonna start thinking that way. Well, more. it's it's to me it's again, it's trying to create the simplest way when you get to mixed so you can be creative at mixed. Yeah. I don't think you can be creative at mixed when you've got you know, and a lot of mixers do it. They have the drum sound, then they have the parallels, then they have the buses. And I can't think, man, when I look at all that together, I can't think of it. I get stressed out. It's like, oh, I forgot to turn down the parallel. Oh, yeah. I forgot to turn down this. And yeah. man, it's just too much for me. So stereo yeah. set of drums or mono print of drums back through a tape machine. Yeah. It, it, there's it, the drums. It, it makes yeah. sense. Um, I reduce my mixes to five auxes. auxiliary That's great. Tracks. Now they're not printed, but they're but you only see that. Well, right? you know what helps sometimes for me, Dave, uh, is the level of the music and the ratio of the music to the drums. If it's too low, it's a hip hop song. If it's a little higher, it's a um, it's a pop song. And if it's right. even higher, it's a jazz song. So sometimes you can find that little element where the where the vibe and everything just connects, Change, like old yeah. three day old spaghetti sauce. That's and just, cool. And so I I I, I just realized I did that. You do the same, pretty much the same thing, you know. In terms of, of um, American sound, uh, I've been listening to a lot of the recordings on that. What a great project. How did that come about and what was your... American sound? Not American sound. What's your the label project with everybody on it? Oh, Southern Family. Southern Family. Oh, yeah. Man, um, people should be aware of that project because it, it's... it's um, man, I, I was listening to it about a week ago, uh, a lot of that material and, and just... I'm, I'm, I'm laughing and I'm crying. I'm, I went through so many emotions. How did that project come about? There's a record called uh, White Mansions. This English guy, Paul Kennelly, wrote. Mm -hmm. And uh, it had always been my favorite record. It was recorded by Glenn Johns in Olympic. Mm -hmm. Had Waylon Jennings and Jesse Coulter and Eric Clapton playing mm -hmm. on the record. And that's one of my favorite records of all time. And so I think it started with looking for an excuse to get away with murder and make a concept record, you know? Mm -hmm. And so. It was real fortunate to have worked with people I really adore, so I got to call them and be on it, but also got to work with people I never worked with before. Mm -hmm. It was a good excuse to have community. I, I feel like mm -hmm. any time I've worked with an artist, I always want them to meet the other artists I work with that I, that I like. And I think, I think by doing that, you create community. You know, I love it when I see my, my favorite people hanging out with each other. And I think that, you know, mm -hmm. when you you see people like Chris Stapleton hanging out with young guys like Anderson East and uh -huh. and and they're hanging out and they're making music together, they're writing together. Yeah. It just it strengthens community. But also you know? too it caught it caught the imagination of the community because near the end stars were reaching out to be on the record that you thought maybe we earlier they might super not be lucky, interesting. Yeah. yeah. Uh my favorite is the Brandy Clark song. I we I, cut that I, all completely live. That um, is a live vocal I record. Take a pill, um it's uh, better dig too. I, 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 she's my. She's no incredible. No offense to writer. anybody else, but she's my favorite writer because she's got this this Oscar Wilde sarcasm wit in her music, but, but it's kind of dark, but yet it's uplifting. And, and and each one's a little kind of photograph of an element of society that that, that I don't know too many writers that can do that. She's, she's Charlie. She's Charlie magic. Wor Worsham does that for me yeah. a little bit. Um, uh, the Day I Learned to Pray is one of my favorite songs, but Brandy is, 
special in that song. Well, is aside so from good. her writing, her singing is yeah incredible. And it's funny because when we were when we cut that song, she's such a good singer. And we had you know uh, this guy Robbie Turner playing Steels, uh -huh. kind of a legend uh -huh. on yeah. it. And uh, you know these guys don't mess up. All the all musicians they don't mess up. And uh, we all messed up the first take uh -huh. because we were hearing her vocals come and just couldn't believe that was live, that was actually happening. So she's that good of a singer. Wow, she's good at everything she yeah, does. Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah, if you're listening to this, um, please please check this project out because it's more than a record. It's more than than the poor description I'm giving to it. It's it's um, it's, it's everything you know about how to make a great record if you're an engineer and if you're an artist, it's, it's everything you need to know about being an artist. If you're a songwriter, it's everything you need to know about being a songwriter. It's just a, a wonderful, wonderful uh, labor of love that you were able to put that together. And I don't know how you did that and had the patience to do it. But how many songs are on it? I think there's 12, but it was it was fun. Actually, it wasn't, it was, it was hard scheduling, but the music was just, a blessing, you know. It was, you know, I, I'm from the South and moved to California, mm -hmm. and uh, didn't we all? And I got, <laughs> I got really romantic about being from the South after I left. And you know, I, the I, record's a reflection of me, yeah. the way it felt in my head yeah. of growing up, and so that was really yeah. an excuse to kind of have people write songs about growing up in the South and their families and their uncles and parents and grandparents and little personal stories, you know. Your production style, not so much from a from a audio standpoint, but from um, just a person-to-person, -person, psychological, let's call it, standpoint. I, I don't want you to give too many things away because I, I know that you need to um, Have tricks. draw the best out of it. They're not really tricks. <laughs> no, They're techniques no, to no, draw no, the best true. out of yeah. a performer. Can you share some, some stories with us or some techniques that, that would make me better at recording a vocalist or, or a, a band? Man, uh, I, I, I try think, to become a cheerleader. And I feel like, yeah, you know, I, I never really went to, went to recording school, but I think the first thing they teach is should be hang, hang 101. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I definitely feel when certain people come in the room, the air leaves or, or they <laughs> yeah. add something to it. So yeah. to me, it's about trying to surround yourself with, you know, if if, if I'm producing, I have an engineer that's a, that's a really talented engineer, but also a really great hang. So I try to start with just, you know, making the room fun, you know. It doesn't, we don't have to start at one o'clock. We don't have to roll tape at all that day. We can go out to dinner and goof off and have a bottle of wine and tell jokes. And, you know, I stole some of my tricks from, from Chris Stapleton because the first time we did Traveler, we were getting here and just ordering lunch, goofing off, telling jokes, drinking, uh -huh. ordering dinner, telling uh -huh. jokes, goofing off. And we didn't record until nine o'clock at night. Uh -huh. But then we get two or three masters that night. Wow. It was just the right time. And he has a whole thing now. He's like, don't do vocals in the day. And I get uh, it. I love it. And, and he, knows, he knows himself. But it's really about feeling when it's time to record. I, I hate structure in a session. I hate it. Yeah, it's I just, do too. And deadlines and times. Yeah, and can you all. imagine you know, an artist going, okay, I need this painting by 12 o'clock. And make sure you got three birds in it because that's what yeah. the client's asking for. I, try to, I always have this saying uh, when I get a little behind, I'm irritating people that... Uh, if Michelangelo didn't have a, uh, the Pope to tell him to stop painting the Sistine Chapel, he'd still be painting it <laughs> <That's true>. hundreds <laughs> of years later. <laughs> That's true. I, I think just really trying to create that feeling mm -hmm. of when you first got in a band and what was so fun about it. Yeah. That's, that's what we try to do. So you try and, you try and relax. Uh, the studio environment, when I was younger, I played in some studios, I did some sessions, and Boy, I didn't like that feeling of the microscope and everybody looking at me. I'd look in the control room and all the engineers were like, "Yeah." And I'm trying to, I'm trying to now, like, yeah. you know, get myself up and yeah. and uh, and I always felt like like they were dissecting every little note I was doing. Did I, did I do my bends exactly in tune? Did I do all this? And I couldn't play because of all of those restrictions. Well, so, one one thing that's great about everybody playing together is mm -hmm. that no one's under a microscope. Wow. And singers, particularly. That's headline number two. What I never thought of that. It's well, so obvious. you know, like a singer, for instance, I think it's the most awkward thing. A lot of modern records, and I was guilty of doing it the same way when I first started, where you do the drums, and you make sure the drums are good, then you mm -hmm. do the bass, the mm -hmm. assembly line process, mm -hmm. and the last thing most people record is a vocal. What's the first thing people listen to? Yeah. The vocal, and and then it makes a singer real conscience. Uh, they, 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 they really know what's going on. They're really you know, know it's about them and they're trying to perfect their thing. But when everybody's playing together, 
it's not about them. And mm -hmm. pe people know that people are kind of worrying about their own parts a little bit. And so they're having fun. Yeah. And I think the moment that switches to a typical record tracks and overdub session, yeah. it, they're really, they really know, know that it's about them and they get freeze up a little bit. Yeah. I've got the best vocal performance Always get the best vocal performances cutting with the band. Always, uh, yeah. I mean, you can punch Everybody's them in later if you need to fix something, but that the yeah. that's that's when you get the singer to sing. You know. I think when I survey the world of music, I think different types of music are best enhanced by different techniques. Like like a, a lot of people that come from the live space uh, look down on the on the program music space. The program music guys look down on the live guys. And, and the, 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 the danger in that is that you, 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 you block out a lot of techniques that could be shared by both communities. Absolutely. And rather than say better or worse, one of the things that I truly love about the, a, a, a band working together is there's a dynamic that you can't get any other way, that dynamic of, of everybody ebbing and flowing together Absolutely. in terms of timing. So we didn't know we played out of time until drum machines came along because we couldn't tell because if the right. band goes together it's harder to dictate timing but what you get is feel now in the program world it works by giving you a hypnotic background which the things on top of it those dynamics become way more important than a, the dynamics inside of a band so in a band the dynamics move together so there's nothing more dynamic right. than anything else but in program music the the, the hypnosis of that 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 steady volume right. allows the dynamic to be more important, so you can do different things with the vocalist. Neither, neither one's better I'm or worse. I'm all of it. It's, 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 but that live dynamic, if you want that, that's the only way you're going to get it. And when you get it, it's the, one of the most beautiful groove feels there is on the planet. I agree. I've been fascinated. I was with an a, a artist I'm working with right now, and he was describing you know, the beginning rock and roll. And I think the beginning, and he, he said it, I'm, I'm stealing his wording, mm. is that it happened when somebody was swinging and somebody was playing straight together. No joke. That rub that happens when one person going, and the other person going, when, yeah. they, when they go together, yeah. that's that's something live that just I can't never happen thought about in that. another way. And he was, he was referring to Chuck Berry, you know? And, yeah. And it, that, that's when rock and roll happened, you know? Yeah. So that's something you can only get in a live environment when somebody yeah. just has a totally different feel but then the other person is playing a different way, and we put them together. That's that yeah. that thing that kind of yeah. makes you move, you yeah. know. It doesn't always work, but no. when it does, it's kind of Most of the time, special. it doesn't work, but it's magic yeah. when it does. You know, something about the old recordings. Uh, we've both done this. We both visited the great cathedrals of the music we like. You know, like Sun and yeah. and uh, Fame and all those great studios. <clears throat> and you walk in, and you're like, "Wow, this is a dump. How could you make a great record here?" And then you go back to your real expensive studio and you try to capture and you can't because that there was each one of those places had this unique flavor that the only funk. came from yeah. being a dump, you know? Yeah. And uh, and I'm using dump respectfully. I'm not I'm not yeah. trying to be critical, but when you when you look at where all those great Motown records were made, you're like, how did they even fit that many people in here? And much less make I, these. I records. think that was less the room and more of those players, man. I mean, they yeah. had the most talented bass player of all time in that that, yeah. that arrangement. More I, I than guess one. also too, when 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 everybody's going down this lane, maybe it's more important in in the in the world of of contemporary music to go down this one little tiny lane by yourself. And, and be I don't different. Th I don't think I started making records to be different. I just think the moment I stopped Nobody does, but yeah, you the, are. The moment I stopped caring about selling records, the moment I stopped caring about trying to have a hit song or hit record or mm -hmm. what people thought, that's when I feel like I kind of found my groove. And once I was in a room making records that, that I dug and the, and the artists really loved, I feel like that's when we started having success. Yeah. Yeah, so I, could, I just pretty much put blinders on, you know? Mm -hmm. One last question before yeah. I let you go. Um, I don't know how to phrase this, um, but when you started having success, how did you fight the temptations that come along with success and maintain who you are and who you want to be and, and the music you want to make and the temptations to try and amplify that success? Success can be a, a career killer. In your case, it was a career enhancer. Can you give some advice to the young kid coming up that just has a massive record their first time out. How do you deal with success? I think I think 
anytime somebody has a little bit of success, it'll mess you up for a second. I think we all go through it. <laughs> First thing I ever did was bought a nice car, and I bought it home about my wife was eight months pregnant, and she told me to take it back. So wow. I think it messes with everybody a little bit. But musically, you know? how yeah. did it affect you? Like for me, uh, my first success, uh, Herb kept getting calls for that song, part two, part three, part four, part five, and the temptations uh, yeah, I, I, to do that. I, yeah, I, I don't. Couldn't I resist. don't take gigs when they want me to make a record that sounds like X artist. Mm -hmm. You know, I just the the one thing I've always admired people like Rick Rubin. I think he has the ideal yeah. career because Rick Rubin's able to do a hip hop record. He's able to do a metal record. He's able to do a country record, a folk record, and I would love to be able to have a career like that where I'm not the one dimensional kind of producer. Well, you, you, you know, you know we're near that, my friend. No. Listen, great seeing you again. Good seeing you as well, Always man. Been a favorite. Thank you all for coming and, uh, by. Man, uh, we need to figure out what happened to DARP because uh, uh, I, I, I think somebody told me it changed the name or something. But anyway, um, I'm going to... Man, I hate to stop talking to you, oh, but man. we, we got to shut this by. thing down. I know you got a session, but man, thank you so much. Thank y'all. Right. I appreciate it, man. Right. I'll see bye you bye again. Thank y'all. One of the things that uh, is my favorite perk about uh, what Herb and I do on Tuesdays when we tape and what you see later in the week is that um, I get to be inspired and I get to meet people. And uh, when, when you meet some of these guys, you leave and you just feel inadequate. And so you get home, come back to L.A., after our trip in Nashville, and just work on stuff that you learned while you were there and try to get better. And um, I hope you feel the same way about some of the guests we have and follow some of the threads of thought that they've uh, shared with us on the show and, and do the same thing. It's, it's made me a better mixer, and I think it'll make you a better mixer, too. And See I got a time. cool picture with me and the dog, RCA dog. <laughs> we'll show that. Yeah. See ya!